they starved to death when he had been in prison for car theft. When the bodies of Julie and Melissa were discovered, a terrible collective emotional shock went through the country. Dutroux had left his wife, Michel Martin, to feed Julie and Melissa, but she claimed she was too afraid to go into the dungeon where they were held. Child psychologist Jean-Yves Ayer spoke out about the case. He felt that Dutroux's wife's personality may have played a part in her husband's horrific crimes. I think Michel Martin was a passive and masochistic woman. And I think she was very afraid of him. To me, she's responsible as well for not having talked, for not having turned him in. Well, she could even have done it anonymously if she was so afraid. But she didn't. Seventeen days after his first confession, Dutroux leads police to a property in the town of Jumet, where investigators discover the bodies of Anne Marshall and F.A. Lambrex, who had disappeared while on holiday more than a year earlier. The girls had been drugged and buried alive. For Paul Marshall, the search for his daughter is over. It was, of course, very painful. It's hard to accept at that moment. You know they're not suffering anymore. They're not there anymore. And you have to learn to live with it. All six missing girls have now been found. Belgium struggles to come to terms with the tragedy. Throughout the country, there was a lot of distress, a lot of anger, a lot of sadness and incomprehension. The country was facing evil and the slaughter of innocents. Parents wouldn't let their children go out in the streets anymore. Now in custody, it falls to psychologists to assess the character of a man who has readily confessed to committing horrific and callous crimes. My colleagues who carried out the assessment labeled him a perverted psychopath and not fundamentally a pedophile. In the sense that to him, children weren't an exclusive object of lust. They were an object among others. It is soon established that Dutroux's psychopathic nature could have its roots in a turbulent and loveless childhood that saw him turn to petty crime and sell himself to elder men for sex in his teens. He's grown up in a, a bit of traditional uh, family nest for, for psychopaths. Very dominant mother, um, very aggressive father, a very egoistic couple, and as a result, a very egoistic young Marc Dutroux. But to fully understand who they're dealing with, investigators speak to Sabine Dardenne, who has survived 11 weeks in Dutroux's clutches. With her testimony, they start to build a profile of a man whose crimes have shocked the world. After being snatched on her way to school, Sabine was driven to a house in Marcinelle, a suburb of Charleroi, a city in Belgium's decaying industrial heartland. Sabine was drugged by her captor, led upstairs to the first floor, and chained to a bed. She was given an elaborate story by Dutroux, explaining why she had been kidnapped. He explained to her that she had been kidnapped in exchange for a ransom but that her parents had refused to pay the ransom and so the people who had ordered the kidnapping had given him the order to execute her. And since he himself was very nice, he had decided to protect her. He 
In exchange for this protection, she should grant him some favors, and everyone understands what that meant. Trapped and alone, Sabine Dauden was repeatedly raped by her captor, or in his words, her savior. He's someone who likes to hurt. He's someone who likes to practice mental manipulation in all regards. To hurt mentally, to hurt physically. As the weeks passed, Sabine was confined to a specially constructed dungeon, three feet wide and nine feet long. She kept a diary day by day, in which she drew across when Dutrou had come and abused her. One cross meant it hurt. Two crosses meant it hurt badly. Sabine's captor allowed her to write letters, which he promised to send to her parents. I promise to be less selfish and also lend my things, be more helpful, be better tempered. I'm sure you'll find that I've changed. But the letters were never sent. I think the majority of children would have interpreted the lack of rescue as a sign their parents no longer cared about them, because there is a naivety about children. Please think long and hard about what I've said. I can't carry on like this for much longer. But Sabine's testimony also raises big questions. How has Marc Dutroux been able to operate so freely and for so long? Could the police have stopped him sooner? Could lives have been saved? As more chilling details emerge, the world looks on in horror as Belgian society approaches meltdown. In August 1996, 12-year-old Sabine Dardenne and 14-year-old Letitia Delay were rescued from a cellar beneath a dilapidated house in southern Belgium. Letitia had been imprisoned for six days, Sabine for 79. But while they have survived, four other girls have perished at the hands of their captor, Marc Dutroux. Over the next few months, a series of devastating revelations emerge about Dutroux's past and his relationship to the country's authorities. Belgians realize in horror that the police could have arrested him long ago, potentially saving the lives of four young girls. The name of Marc Dutroux was in the file less than two weeks after the disappearance of Julie and Melissa. So the police had all the information they could all the conditions to arrest Marc Dutroux were met many months before his actual arrest. The abductions that followed Julie and Melissa's kidnapping could have been avoided. We are absolutely positive that Dutroux could have been arrested. Information comes to light. In 1989, six years before the disappearance of Julie Lejeune and Melissa Rousseau, Dutroux and his wife had been convicted of the abduction and rape of five girls. Dutroux was released just three years into a 13-year sentence. It was completely predictable that this guy would relapse. A time bomb. A powerful time bomb was ticking. From his release in 1992, warning signs were flashing. A police informant claimed he was asked by Dutroux to help him kidnap a girl. Dutroux's own mother even tipped off police that her son may be hiding girls in his home.
Eventually, in August 1995, the police put him under surveillance, an operation codenamed Othello. A camera was hidden in a railway wagon in front of his house in Massinel. This camera was in front of the house the night that uh, Anne and Ephia were kidnapped. The problem was that uh, the crew chose to do this uh, kidnapping uh, at night and the police turned off the camera uh, at 6 o'clock in the evening. Afterwards they tell us that for operational reasons this camera has only been turning from uh, 8 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock in the evening or something. This is very intelligent if you want to catch uh, someone, a pedophile kidnapping girls. The officer in charge of Operation Othello, René Michaud, visited the house in December 1995. Dutroux had recently been questioned about stolen cars, and investigators used this as an opportune moment to search his house. Also present was a locksmith, Alain Lejeune, who was accompanying the police in their search. Qu'est-ce qu'on entend? Il y, a, il y a des enfants ici? Suddenly, children's voices are heard. You heard these voices and this discussion starts. Did you hear that? No, ce sont des enfants dehors. Oui, ils jouent dehors. Ah non, ce bruit vient de l'intérieur. Écoutez, c'est clair. Silence. Non, et puis, puis c'est qui le policier ici? Allez, on y va. The locksmith said, I heard voices, and it was absolutely clear that they came from there, from two meters from where we, st where we were standing. The voices are Melissa Rousseau and Julie Lejeune. Three months later, they were dead. Do not forget that this Julie and Melissa disappearance was the top story in Belgium. That was the absolutely the top priority of police. Uh, at least that's what they told us. Michaud found video cassettes during his search. They didn't watch the tapes. The explanation afterwards that they didn't have a, a video player. On one of these tapes, we can see Mark Dutroux constructing his, his cage. The explanation of where it was and how it was constructed was, was on tape. They just had to watch it, but they had no video player. There again, that's official version. Sorry, I don't buy it. René Michaud always claimed that the door to the dungeon was so well hidden, it was impossible for him to realize its true significance. A claim backed by other investigators who have been in the house. The space in which the children were confined, it was hard to see, because shelves had been placed in front of the door. There were plenty of boxes, rubbish, everything was stacked. So no one could ever suspect that behind that wall, a cell had been built to hide children in. I cannot conceive of any investigator who wouldn't go all out while looking for a missing girl. Michaud, who died in January 2009, stated that his failure to find the girls haunted him. Others are skeptical. To accept the word incompetence, sorry, there's, there's a limit to what you can consider as being incompetence. Toute la Belgique recherche ses enfants. The whole of Belgium was searching for the kids. And the gendarmerie knows Dutroux, with his past as a child abuser. They know he's building suspect hiding places in some of his houses. And yet, for some totally incomprehensible reason, Marc Dutroux wasn't arrested. Belgians begin to ask whether Marc Dutroux is being protected by powerful people within the state. While in custody, Dutroux himself fans the flames of conspiracy with a controversial claim which will forever change the global perception of this case. He states he is part of a national paedophile network whose tentacles stretch right to the top of Belgian society. Investigating judge Jean-Marc Connorot is put in charge of preparing the case against Dutroux. He is determined 